Bioshock Infinite is a pretty good game. There's a lot that it does well, but there's also a lot that it does wrong. It's got a fantastic story, with a wonderful dynamic between its two main characters. But it also has a severe lack of interesting world building and an awful DLC that was ultimately unnecessary. Welcome back to another story review, the series where I not only give you a retelling of a game's story, but also my thoughts along the way. So without further ado, let's get started. So firstly, since this is the final game in the series, I do have a question for you all. Would you prefer that I take each of these videos on the games and combine them into one full-length project? It would be the same videos as before, but I understand lots of you prefer to watch these while doing other tasks. So now you can just go to that video instead of flipping through the channel to find all three parts. Plus, I'll most likely add some other sections to that video that I didn't include in the other parts, like the two novels that we haven't discussed yet. So let me know what you think. So where else would we start then at the intro? This is the most important part of a game's story, but this is taken to the extreme with Bioshock, as these intros are made to intrigue the player enough to keep going. You may find this confusing, as I literally just described what an intro was meant to do, but think back on the previous games for a moment. Bioshock 1's story was a bit confusing, as all of a sudden we arrive at Rapture and are helping the first guy we meet, without even a chance to question why we're doing this in the first place. Bioshock 1 obviously clears this up at the end of the game in one of the best ways I've ever seen, but I can almost guarantee that the setting and combat of Bioshock 1 carried you throughout the game rather than the story of just killing the big bad guy. Well, Bioshock Infinite does the same thing. Its story is hidden and never mentioned until the very end. And because the devs know this, they need to intrigue the player enough in other ways to keep them going, like the aforementioned setting and gameplay. This is why it builds off the original game's unique introduction. Bioshock Infinite starts in 1912, with the player on a boat being taken to a lighthouse. For context, since this game is in 1912, that means we are 48 years before Bioshock 1 even occurs. That means all the previous games and their events had never happened yet. Rapture wasn't built, hell, I don't even think Ryan was born yet. We also get to see our character's face, hear their voice, and know their name, all within about two minutes, which is a lot faster than the previous games. Our protagonist's name is Booker DeWitt, who was brought here to do a job. Booker is then given a box with a few items, such as a pistol, a code, a picture of our target, among other items. The picture of the girl has a note on the back that says, Bring the girl to New York unharmed so we can assume that we're here to find this person on the card. The people taking us to the location are unknown, as they're only referred to as man and lady. However, the way they talk is odd, almost as if they're watching us from a distance. They don't talk to Booker, and if he doesn't climb the ladder, they'll say this. He's not moving! He will, eventually. I suppose he does. It's like they think they're invisible or analyzing some experiment like some scientists would do. It just feels off. As we approach the lighthouse, we get more information on the task at hand, as the note reads, bring us the girl and wipe away the debt. Once again, we can assume that Booker has some debts that need to be paid, and it's because of these debts that he took this job in the first place. Everything initially looks pretty normal, until we see someone dead and tied up with a sign that reads, don't disappoint us. It continues to get even weirder, as when we finally get to the top of the lighthouse, we input the code and the sky turns red momentarily, as a horn blares every time the color changes. A chair appears, and seeing as we're at the top without anywhere else to go, we take a seat. Make yourself ready, Pilgrim. The bindings are there as a safeguard. No, no, God damn it! Ascension. Ascension in the count of five. Count of four. Three. Two. One. Words cannot describe the beauty of Colombia. It's truly a magnificent place. But after we arrive, we see a lot of religious symbolism and are told that to enter Colombia, we have to be reborn anew via baptism. We accept and are able to explore Colombia to our heart's content, but we have to remember that we're in uncharted territory and have to blend in, except that may not be as easy as it sounds, as we discover that the false shepherd is prophesied to enter Colombia with a defining mark of an AD on their hand. The same one that Booker has. We enter the city's raffle, win, and are given the reward of pelting a couple with a baseball until our identity is revealed and are forced to fight. 
I know I sped through that, so allow me to explain why. Bioshock Infinite on its own has a pretty fantastic intro, arguably the best in the series, but it reaches unprecedented levels of quality when you take into account Bioshock 1. Columbia and even Bioshock Infinite are the antithesis of Rapture and Bioshock 1. Not just in the setting of the two games, but the values of each setting and the actual sequence of events that occur in the game's intros. It's clear from the first moment of the game that the developers took heavy inspiration from the original, the reason being that Irrational Games, the devs behind Bioshock 1, also made Infinite, whereas 2K Games, Irrational Games' publisher, made Bioshock 2. That's not only why Bioshock 2 feels so different from the other games, but why these two feel so similar. Bioshock 1 starts on a plane that crashes in the ocean. We then take it to a lighthouse, which then leads to Rapture. We start in the sky and end in the sea, with the lighthouse being the mediator between these two parts of the world. Whereas Bioshock Infinite starts in the sea and ends in the sky, with the lighthouse being the mediator again. One game's start is the other game's end. Our first encounter with Rapture is quite dark, as the first person we see gets his guts spilled on the floor by a splicer. From the moment we enter Rapture, we are thrown into the deep end. However, as you play, you start to appreciate Rapture more, and it's almost like a home away from home. Minus the splicers, of course. Rapture's a really relaxing place, and the thought of what this looked like in its prime gives you that sort of warm and welcoming feeling. Whereas Columbia does not. Our first interaction with Columbia is the opposite of dark. We're welcomed by many religious people before walking the streets of the city, where the citizens of Columbia will be having wonderful conversations about the city and will even greet and compliment Booker. You get that warm feeling that Rapture provides later in the game at the very start, but that warm feeling goes away eventually as you uncover Columbia's true backstory. Furthermore, each city's ideologies couldn't be farther from one another. Rapture's tagline is no gods or kings, only men. On top of this, religion, while accepted, is not publicly shown, as Andrew Ryan didn't want any public institutions related to religion within Rapture. This is why we see the Bible amongst the cargo and smugglers' hideout. In Columbia, religion is the basis for its creation, where the people of the city worship Father Comstock, who is the leader of the Founders, a group and religion based on many traditional religious and patriotic values. We're also immediately greeted by religious quotes and Bible verses while descending into Columbia. Upon stepping out, we see a stained glass painting depicting Father Comstock bringing the people to Columbia, and there's also tons of other statues showing the city and Father Comstock's glory. I'm not a religious person, so I can't say with complete certainty, but I'm convinced that majority of these depictions of Father Comstock are literally ripped from famous artwork related to Jesus and the Bible. Because while I can't put my finger on what exactly it's referencing, these paintings feel oddly familiar to me, as if I'd seen them before in a different context. We are then shown this massive room filled with candles and water that is used for prayer and baptisms. Once we awake in Columbia, we can see the statues of the Founding Fathers who are also revered as religious or at least prominent figures within Columbia. So we have a king in the form of Father Comstock who worships a higher being, quite different than what Andrew Ryan believed in. Ryan believed in objectivism, a belief based on the individual, and due to Rapture's location and values, it allowed those involved to succeed on an individual level. This even extends to the gameplay, as while some splicers work together, not everyone is aligned with one another. Everyone seems to be acting out of pure self-interest. In Colombia, its citizens work together for the benefit of the city and the father. They're acting as a group, rather than individuals, sort of like the family from Bioshock 2. But by far its most staggering difference is in its inclusivity. Ryan and Rapture didn't really care about the inner workings of a person as long as that person had the drive to seek something greater in their life. In Rapture, there is a prominent picture called the Rapture's Best and Brightest, and within this picture are both men and women. Those women also being Tenenbaum and Sophia Lam, arguably the two most important women in Rapture. There's also Dr. Su Chong, who is of Asian ethnicity, and while not in the picture, there's also Charles Milton Porter, owner of The Thinker, and he's African American. Rapture is also very accepting in regards to sexual orientation, as Sander Cohen, one of Rapture's best and brightest, is gay. Given the time frame of the game, it's possible people will have their own opinions on someone's sex and race, but at the very least, they're welcomed into Rapture and not rejected for their differences. This is in stark contrast to Columbia, where most of its regular residents are white. In fact, the first black person we see is tied to a post, because this couple is in an interracial relationship. Since Columbia is ruled by one man and not ruled by the city's basis of creation, that person's ideologies are the golden rule of the city. And Father Comstock is a white supremacist who is extremely racist against anyone who isn't white and refuses to condemn organizations that believe in this ideology. A good example is the Order of the Ravens in Colombia, who believe in racial purity. This is reinforced by the fact that they are not only dressed as KKK members, but have paintings and statues that depict Abraham Lincoln as the devil and John Wilkes Booth, his assassin, as a hero. Within the organization, we can also see a Chinese prisoner being tortured and killed via ravens, and to top it all off, we see a statue outside of the building of Comstock defeating a multi-headed serpent. 
However, this serpent has the heads of three men, who are black, Chinese, and Jewish, all with exaggerated features like big noses and lips. As for things such as gender or sexual orientation, it's not outright said, but there is definitely some hints that Columbia's values fit with ones from the current time period. There's a severe lack of LGBT representation in this game, with the only ones I could find being the rare case a guy hits on Booker. Furthermore, women, at least those within authority or power, seem to be tolerated rather than celebrated. There's a kinetoscope of Rosalind Lutes, who is a quantum physicist and the sole reason Columbia can even float to begin with. But in this film, at the end, there's a question that says, how does that darn thing fly? To which she responds, it's quantum mechanics. But at the bottom it reads, we say it's more like women's intuition. However, there is clearly women in power like Daisy Fitzroy, so while this doesn't outright prove that all women aren't viewed the same as men, at the very least it shows how much people downplayed Lutece's creation of Columbia and her intelligence. And seeing as she's easily one of the most important women and the most intelligent person in Columbia, I can't imagine how a regular woman would be seen within the eyes of men. Besides all the symbolism and ideologies regarding Columbia, the actual interactions within the intro are extremely fun. Before taking part in the raffle, we can explore the carnival area, where we can take part in carnival games involving weapons and vigors, which acts as a sort of hidden tutorial. We also see these weird interactions, most notably the statue of Rosalind Lutes changing to who we'll discover is Robert Lutes, this telegram being given to Booker that says not to pick number 77, which happens to be the ball we choose at the raffle, and then the final one where the Lutesses make us play heads and tails, and not only does heads win every time, but it's won a lot. All of them are nice touches and subtle hints regarding the game's actual plot. Bioshock 1 and Infident are the complete opposite of one another, and it's by far the best dichotomy I've seen in a game to date. Bioshock 2 built off the world of the first game, but decided to change the ideology of Rapture to show how the other end of the spectrum could operate in the same city. But Infinite took this idea and ran with it, by not only creating a city completely opposite to Rapture in just about every way, but also took specific moments and cutscenes from the first game and made those opposite when compared together. It's genius game design, genius storytelling, and overall gives Bioshock Infinite the best intro in the series. Getting back on track, we just turned a guard's brains to mush and are now fighting the Colombian police while trying to find the girl we came here for. Within this section is the aforementioned Order of Ravens, but there also seems to be a secret home a little farther down for people who actually praise Abraham Lincoln. There isn't much here, but it is nice to see that some of the residents don't all share the same values. After multiple battles with the city's police, we're briefly stopped by Comstock himself, who claims to not only know who Booker is, but all of his past sins, including Wounded Knee, the Pinkertons, his gambling and alcohol addiction, and someone named Anna. This made the situation a bit more tense, as now we aren't operating away from the watchful eye of Comstock, as he not only knows who Booker is, but why he is here. It makes the player question who this Comstock really is, and how he's related to Booker. Furthermore, it also forces the player to question what Booker did. We then make it to Monument Island, the place where this girl should be located, and it's clear here that the game is trying to set up the typical girl trapped in the tower trope. But the way this was presented in the game is really well done, as once again, these chilling feelings of the story continue to grow. All throughout the area are caution signs and a plethora of equipment and wires that make it feel like a laboratory rather than a home. It's a lot different than what one would expect, as you would think this girl is either relaxing in some random house or at a very top of a luxurious tower. And while the latter is technically true, large rich towers don't usually come equipped with caution signs and chalkboards full of data. It continues to get even weirder as we see photography rooms filled with pictures of her and rooms that seem to be made for testing an experiment, most likely involving her. There's even a projector that has some film of this girl doing specific tasks like dancing, painting, and lockpicking. We then get to see how the operation was created as there's two-way mirrors in these rooms, allowing them to spy on her without her knowing. We also get to see her open a portal to another world before closing it momentarily. It's given just the right amount of time to confuse the player on what the hell just happened without it being overly long, and also calls back to the rest of the tower. Now it makes sense why they were testing and observing her, she clearly has these superpowers. Booker tries to find his way around the rooms, but falls through the ceiling, which rightfully startles her. This girl is Elizabeth, and she is one of the most intricate characters in the entire series. She is shocked by Booker's arrival in the tower, and attacks him until she realizes this is the moment she's been waiting for. She can now finally escape this tower that she has been stuck in since she was a child. So Elizabeth and Booker escape the tower together until Elizabeth's mechanical bodyguard Songbird shows up and attempts to stop Booker. The bird almost succeeds, but Booker, despite falling an incredibly far distance, is able to live thanks to falling into one of Columbia's beaches. So what's really going on here? Well, Elizabeth has the unique ability to open tears. These tears are essentially ripples in time that allow the person viewing the tear to see into an alternate dimension. This is why we can hear the song Fortunate Son through one of the tears later in the game, despite that song not being created for another 40 years. 
ears. These tears aren't unique to the individual, as we see more kinetoscopes of people talking about the tears. So everyone can view them, but not everyone can create them. The two most notable characters that can create these tears is Elizabeth and Lutess. Rosalind before Columbia was experimenting with atoms and found a way to indefinitely suspend atoms in midair. This led to the aptly named Lutess field discovery. Comstock would eventually meet with Lutess through some way and through their collaboration would create Columbia using her Lutess field. As thanks for helping create the floating city, Comstock promised that she could continue her experimentation, and it was during these experiments that she met Robert. Despite what the game will initially tell you, Robert is not the twin of Rosalind. He is Rosalind. In an alternate world, Rosalind was born a man named Robert. These two are the same person, just in different timelines. As for Elizabeth, she was able to create tears from a very early age. It's not explained why just yet, but it will be towards the end of the game. Whereas Lutess is able to create one through science and experimentation, Elizabeth can just create one when she wants. She also mentions that when she was younger, she was able to create new worlds with these tears, but now she isn't able to as often. This is most likely due to the siphon equipment in the tower, as it's literally siphoning her powers away. I don't think it's necessarily removing it altogether, but more like storing it, as when we get to the end of the game, she is way more powerful, implying that we were able to give them back to her. Speaking of Elizabeth, after we regain our footing on the beach, we go to find her and try to get her out of the city, but it seems that Comstock and his forces have already caught on to our location. This is also Elizabeth's first time experiencing combat, and I really like how they didn't just have her deal with it, as right at the moment the shooting starts, she runs away and we have to chase her down. The reason she ran is because Elizabeth thinks Booker is a killer, and given how many people we just killed, she's not entirely wrong. I like that Irrational Games took into consideration how Elizabeth would feel after seeing someone die, as it's not something you can simply brush off. This also extends to the numerous other things Elizabeth does, like cover her ears during this scene when the noise gets too loud, or just interacting with the environment like when she asks for cotton candy. It's incredibly small, but it heightens the experience of the game. I find myself always looking at Elizabeth, waiting to see where she'll go next or what she'll say, since her input was always interesting to hear. This also extends to her relationship with Booker. Bioshock 2 had this father-daughter style dynamic as well with Delta and Eleanor, but what I really think makes Infinite better in this regard is because we actually get to spend time with Elizabeth. Obviously the reason why we can't see Eleanor is due to the plot, but still. Elizabeth acts like this little girl who is seeing the world for the first time, and Booker becomes this father figure making sure she doesn't run off and get into danger, and I really love the dynamic they have. After some time, Booker and Elizabeth will come across Lady Comstock's airship as they plan to use that as their means of escape, but it's blocked and can only be accessed by using the Shock Jockey Vigor. This then leads to duo to Cornelius Slate, who has a really interesting section as it forces Booker to confront his past. Slate and Booker knew each other before the events of the game as they were at Wounded Knee together. After this, Booker would reflect on his life and his actions, while Slate would meet and join Father Comstock, who would then lead them to the Boxer Rebellion. Both of these events were gruesome and tragic times for Booker, so having him relive his past while also having Elizabeth discover his past was an intense moment. We the player figured this out alongside Elizabeth, and after this encounter, you start to view Booker as a completely different person, for better or for worse. Both Wounded Knee and the Boxer Rebellion were also real-world events that happened, which made learning about these all the more interesting. Wounded Knee was an awful massacre that saw an army of United States soldiers kill over 300 Native Americans. During this massacre, Booker was accused by a sergeant that he had Native American blood in him. To avoid the backlash and repercussions that would come from this, Booker decided to prove to his fellow men that he was indeed a true soldier of America by scalping many Native Americans and then burning dozens of teepees. Wounded Knee is not only an incredible part of the story as it defines Booker's character, but it's more important for us the player as we get to see who Booker really is, and are given the option to form our own opinion about him that will continue to stay throughout the whole game. For the Bioshock series, this was a nice twist, as we went from having two Samaritans who got caught up in terrible circumstances to a protagonist who was a mass murderer. It's a unique idea for the series, and one that I welcomed. As for the other tragic event in history, the Boxer Rebellion was a war that started because a group of Chinese anti-Christians called the Boxers were killing and massacring Christian missionaries, churches, and parishioners throughout all of northern China. In real life, this led to the creation of the Eight Nation Alliance, which included countries like the British Empire, the United States, Russia, Japan, and many others, all of whom were against the boxers. As for Bioshock Infinite, it's unclear whether Columbia fought them alone or joined the Eight Nation Alliance, but given why this rebellion started, it's obvious Columbia wanted some revenge, even if it didn't directly involve them. These events were a part of Comstock's history, which means it was also part of Columbia's history, which is why there's an exhibit of the events in the Hall of Heroes. However, Slate doesn't like the exhibit, as it claims that Comstock was not only at the Battle of Wounded Knee, but was the hero of the Boxer Rebellion. He's 
technically wrong, but he's technically right, but we'll get to that later. After the exhibit, we can make it to the main attraction, which is another exhibit related to Lady Comstock. Here is where we also get to learn about the Vox Populi. Since entering Columbia, we have heard a few rumors about them, and this is no different. According to the exhibit, we learn that not only is Elizabeth the daughter of Comstock, but Lady Comstock was also murdered by her servant Daisy Fitzroy, who would eventually become the leader of the Vox Populi, a rebellious organization looking to put an end to the current rule of Columbia and take it for their own. Many of its members members are Irish and African American, two groups of people who are notably discriminated against within Colombia. Once again, this is another great moment for the story as we not only got some key information, but Elizabeth is now learning her own backstory alongside us, and the revelation that the man who had locked her up in the tower was her father is a terrifying feeling for her. The seed of the prophet shall sit the throne and drown in flame the mountains of man. Am I? You're Comstock's daughter. No, I can't be. I I can't. He wants you to follow his footsteps. Well, I want a puppy, but that doesn't mean I'm going to get one. The beginning of that speech is also pretty important. As Comstock says, the seat of the prophet shall sit the throne and drown in flame the mountains of man. Remember this for later. Once all the exhibits are done, we can confront Slate so we can get our shock jockey, and it's here where it's probably a good time to mention this game's combat. Infinite's combat bothers me quite a lot. Bioshock 1 and 2 had the uniqueness of the Splicers, who not only had some decent personality via combat dialogue, but also looked unique and were just overall a blast to fight against. I don't feel the same way when I play Infinite. Maybe it's because I like the older game's health system, or that those games had different ammo types with actual unique weapons, or the beauty of the plasmids, but something always feels off every time I play. One other issue is that theme of morality. There is none of that in this game, and for a series that has stuck with it for two straight games, it's a shame to see it disappear in this title. This may have something to do with how the narrative is structured and how we're given the illusion of choice, but Bioshock 1 and 2 did the same thing, and managed to give us multiple endings to this story, and also feel like our choices had some amount of weight to it. This also extends to the larger enemies in the game, whereas in Bioshock 1, deciding to fight the big daddies was an impossible feat. You were supposed to view this as a difficult battle, but assuming you were skilled enough to prevail, you were given an immense amount of gear and atom to use. Infinite doesn't have this, as there's no decisions that hold any weight. You just simply go from objective to objective, fighting people along the way without a care in the world. And while the game isn't that long, it does get quite boring when you just want to learn the story, but are stuck fighting a bunch of enemies because Elizabeth can't pick the lock needed to progress. Even the original games fell into this trap sometimes, but they still managed to add something to the combat, like Sandra Cohen's art exhibit, which is really just a ton of combat back to back. But with the added distinctiveness of the enemies themselves, and the fact that we had to take pictures of their corpses so that we can display them, it added a bit of variety. It wasn't much variety, but it at least made the combat a bit more engaging. The combat in Infinite is very action-y and streamlined. You aren't really fighting for resources or upgrades, as Elizabeth more often than not will keep you stocked when needed. There's no health kits the player can have in stock, and the shield also regenerates. Given these additions, and literally just how the combat arenas work in this game, it's clear that Irrational Games went for a more action-adventure title rather than one that had immersive sim or survival elements. It's practically a railroaded shooter without any variety. This lack of variety also extends to the levels themselves. If I'm being honest, Infinite may have some of the worst levels in the series. Columbia itself is gorgeous, just like Rapture, but throughout the game we were able to see different areas, all with different backstories. I can name quite a few of the levels in the past games, but I can barely remember the names of a couple locations in Columbia, and the only ones I do remember were only because of one scene in the level that either I hated or I loved, other than the actual beauty, creativity, and the lore that the level brings into the world. Bioshock 1 had levels like Hephaestus, Medical Pavilion, Fort Frolic, Arcadia, and so many more that serve some purpose. Fort Frolic was the entertainment center run by Sander Cohen, and Arcadia was a botanical garden that also helped supply Rapture's oxygen. Infinite's levels don't take from what Bioshock 1 started. There is rarely any levels that actually attempt to show that Columbia is more than just a few areas made by some developers. There's no levels that showcase how the quantum particles can suspend the city in the air, how the people of the city can even breathe this high up considering at the very least oxygen would not be plentiful at 15,000 feet, or even where the energy comes from to even power this city. Emporia, a late game area which is known to be a place in Colombia for the ultra rich, looks no different than the welcoming center in the beginning of the game. Thankfully it's not all bad as Shantytown is a really good level that does highlight a lot of differences between the others, but that's only a couple levels out of the total of 16. All of these problems make it quite difficult to play again, and yes, this is more of a critique of the gameplay rather than the story, which is the opposite of the intended purpose for this video, but we have discussed in the previous games how its gameplay was intertwined with the narrative, thanks to the themes of morality with the Little Sisters, and how we're in this unknown location, so by making the game more survival-focused, it tied the game's combat to its story. 
Infinite just feels like a playground adventure where we go on zip lines and mow down dozens of enemies without at all considering that we're literally in the same situation as Delta and Jack. We are lost in an unknown city and have to struggle to survive, but Infinite fails to convey this. Early we talked about the Vox Populi, and it's after the fight with Slade where we get to learn more about them. Elizabeth during our journey says how she wants to escape and go to Paris, but as we remember, Booker has a job to do and that means we go to New York. So when he takes control of the First Lady's airship, he sets the destination to New York. Elizabeth catches onto this and gets a bit emotional. Honestly, I was going to mention how awful her crying is, but it does make sense as she is faking it so that Booker drops his guard so she can knock him out. Elizabeth disappears right after this as she was about to depart, but the Vox Populi show up. Booker then meets with Daisy, and they come to an agreement. If Booker gets Daisy the guns needed for the army, then she'll give him the airship back. Where they drop us off, though, is Finkton, a place owned by Jeremiah Fink, the one we saw in the intro. Even though this is the first time we are without Elizabeth, it doesn't last that long as we'll eventually catch up to her, and while we do repair the relationship, it's not back to what it was before, as Elizabeth is a bit more cynical, and only joins him because he's the only way she'll get to Paris. She sees Booker as a means to an end, similar to how Booker viewed Elizabeth in the beginning. We're only halfway through the game, and already their relationship has taken so many different turns, and it's only going to continue as we progress, and I must say, it's really well done. As I said, we're now in Finkton, and this is one of those locations where I only remember it because of one scene. Ten! Ten! Now ten! Nine and fifty! Nine and fifty! Any lower now? Nine and ten! Nine and ten! Nine, nine, nine! nine. Eight and thirty-three! I hear eight and thirty-three! I don't really have much to add here. I think the scene speaks for itself. People are so desperate enough for jobs that they're willing to fight others to get it. What they're auctioning here, by the way, is their time, saying that they can get the job done faster than anyone else. The first auction that occurred was for someone to haul a half a ton of coal from Fink Manufacturing to Shantytown, and the guy who won believed he could do it in 5 minutes and 50 seconds. It's unclear what happens, but I can only assume if they fail, they probably don't get paid for the job or are unable to work other jobs due to the lack of work ethic in the eyes of the company. Besides being the location of some of the worst conditions in Colombia, it's also here where the story goes off the rails. I briefly talked about the tears and how they are portals to other dimensions, and all of that is shown here. We make it to the gunsmith location and discover that he's gone. However, his wife is still here and says that they took him and locked him up. We end up finding where he's located and also find out that he was being tortured for information. But when we arrive in his cell, we discover that he's dead. The Lutessa show up again and in a cryptic way explain that while we see Mr. Lin as dead, he could also be seen as alive. It's just a matter of perspective. That's when a tear appears and shows that Mr. Lin was never killed in another universe, meaning we can still get the guns to Daisy. Of course, in this version of Columbia, Mr. Lin is alive, but that's not the only thing that's changed. The police we killed earlier are now alive again, but something's wrong. They're alive, but they're dead. They are alive, but they remember being dead, so they're going insane. This sort of situation happens a few times with Booker, where he starts bleeding out of nowhere. The reason he's bleeding is because his mind is taking his current memories and combining it with new memories, and it's causing this nauseous effect in his mind and causing him to bleed. They are alive in this world, but they remember their other selves in a previous timeline dying thanks to these new memories suddenly appearing in their minds when Booker enters this new Columbia. Adding on to more changes, we see that Mr. Lin is alive, but is going a bit insane, but more importantly, his his wife is white now, and now a devout follower of Father Comstock, as opposed to the original version, who was Asian and praying to Buddha. We learn from his wife that the weapons he made are in Shantytown, which is our next stop. Shantytown is a pretty good level, as we get to see how the lower class of Columbia live. There are signs everywhere asking people for food or for a doctor, and the bar down the street even has a corpse in it, and judging from the knife and the blood on the table, I think we know why. As usual, we're going to need to push through lots of guards to make it to our objective, but once we arrive, we hit another roadblock. While in this Columbia, Mr. Lin is alive, the tools are chained up and extremely heavy. However, there's another tear showing that these tools aren't there, meaning they're already back at the shop. So we go through another tear into another Columbia, but once again, this isn't the only thing that has changed. Bring us the girl and wipe away the debt. As plans go, I'd seen worse, except this girl was already gone. Monument Island's a damn ghost town. It seems like they evacuated her when they heard I was here. An old friend told me Comstock spirited her off to that fortress of his. As a one-man job, this just went from betting on the river to drawing dead. 
So it seems that Elizabeth has been taken from Monument Island, and since Booker couldn't find her, it seems like he joined the Vox as a way to take down Comstock. However, judging from the posters, it seems like he died and has now become a martyr for the Vox. I also realize that we're 30 minutes into this video, and I haven't even mentioned the Voxophones yet. Bioshock Infinite, like its predecessors, has audio logs in the form of Voxophones. But unlike the other games, I think Infinite really lacks in this department as well. Some of the audio logs are quite nice, as they do provide a decent amount of story, like some of the ones from Booker's past, or most of Daisy Fitzroy's, but many of them just seem to exist without real substance. I think 60% of them is just speeches from Lady Comstock and Father Comstock about some stuff that really doesn't matter. There is a nice set of logs from a Hattie Gerst, very reminiscent of Mark Meltzer, that talks about her husband and how he came down with an illness, but since there wasn't much that could be done, he decided to become one of the handymen in hopes of having a chance at life, but ultimately would eventually perish at the hands of the Vox when he went to work for the Founders. As I said, there's some pretty decent story within these logs, I just feel like the previous games did it a whole lot better. Getting back on track, we're still in Shantytown in this new Columbia, but Booker starts bleeding again since the memories of his current self and his other self from this universe are blending together. In this Columbia, the Vox not only have a foothold in Shantytown, but also in Finkton, as there are Vox forces everywhere. But every action has its consequences. In this world, while the weapons and tools were brought to the Vox, Mr. Lin and his wife are dead. Elizabeth is upset at this revelation, as while there probably wasn't much they could have done to prevent this outcome, it's still something she hadn't considered. That across multiple timelines and universes, people can be dead and alive at any time. On a more positive note though, we did get Daisy her gun so we can get the airship back. At least that's what Booker believes, because that deal was made with the first Columbia's Daisy Fitzroy. There's no way to be sure that this Daisy made the same deal. I'm not sure if this is to showcase how confused Booker has gotten after jumping through two different worlds or a lack of polish when it comes to this game's writing. After joining the Vox and pushing back the founders, Daisy calls us and our cover's been blown. Daisy believes that we're an imposter of the real Booker DeWitt, so she has the Vox attack us. Once we battle through some of the Vox, we meet Daisy in just at the perfect time to see her kill Fink. And while cool, I gotta ask. What was with this blood wiping thing? I'm not even going to talk about the risk of infection that could happen from this, but what was the point? Was it to show that she's somehow crazy or that she's badass, that she'll kill someone and wipe their blood on her face? I don't know, it just felt really unnecessary. Once again, after more fighting, we can finally confront her, but she has a child held hostage, and the only way to stop her is to have Elizabeth sneak in and kill her. Just like the many interactions we've seen before, this makes total sense. Anyone would be in a state of disarray after taking someone's life, especially someone like her who's a very caring person. This decision, however, changes Elizabeth. She becomes a woman now instead of just a girl. This is symbolized in her cutting her hair and also changing her outfit and demeanor. You may be confused as to how this is supposed to make her a woman, but the DLC will explain this. But we have the airship and can now escape to Columbia, except nothing's ever easy. This highlights a glaring issue with this game, and that's the constant backtracking and cliffhanging when it comes to completing objectives. The other two games did this as well, but they weren't as bad as Infinite. To give you a refresher, we got the objective to reach the First Lady's airship when we landed on the beach. But we were then blocked by the rail system and needed some shock jockey, so we started backtracking. After getting the shock jockey, Elizabeth knocks us out since Booker was going to take her to New York instead. So now we have to join Daisy and get the Vox their guns for their war. Once again, more backtracking. That's also not even getting into the multiple times we have to go through Finkton because Mr. Lin is dead in one world and alive in another, but the tools aren't here but they're in another, so we go back and forth between the same area at least three different times. And then finally, after all these objectives are completed, totaling about four hours of playtime, Songbird comes back and wrecks the airship. I can't decide whether or not I'd actually be more upset if we just simply lost the airship again and had to find it a third time rather than seeing four hours of work get destroyed in a matter of seconds, but either option would definitely not be preferable. You literally spend a third of this game, probably more than that, doing this one objective, but the game attempts to disguise it by giving you small tasks along the way. I would argue this is just as bad as rescuing Atlas's family, which took just as long all for that to fail as well. But not only was this faked and shows the depths that Fontaine was willing to go to succeed, but there was actual emotion behind this scene. It goes from an action-packed race as we try to save the family before they're killed by splicers to immediately shifting into a somber, more emotional track of music with this calming aftermath. We were too late, and Atlas couldn't save his family, and he pours his heart out during this scene, and it emotionally resonates with the player, as not only does Atlas want to kill Ryan, we do as well. Booker and Elizabeth just move right along, completely ignoring the fact that the one thing they've spent hours trying to find is gone. No emotion, no break in the action, just another scene with the Lutesses. It's utterly surreal how I was the only one who was emotionally torn because of this, yet none of the characters seem to agree. This probably wouldn't be half as bad if this tragedy wasn't followed up by probably one of the worst levels in the entire game. Emporia is awful, and literally because of one enemy, Lady Comstock. 
Admittedly, from a story perspective, it's pretty good as we learn that Father Comstock was sterile due to the multiple tests he had done with the tears, meaning Elizabeth isn't related to Father Comstock. And then we also discover that Lady Comstock never actually liked Elizabeth and saw her as an illegitimate child, to which she would eventually attempt to blackmail Father Comstock by claiming to tell all of Columbia that Elizabeth isn't his daughter. He would then take it upon himself to kill her for saying this, but her servant Daisy had walked in during the killing, forcing Comstock to pin the blame on her. Which, of course, explains how Daisy became the leader of the Vox. On top of this, we also learn that the Lutesses were killed by Fink, who was ordered by Father Comstock to carry out the hit. It is some genuinely incredible backstory, and it's a story I've been waiting to hear. It's just a shame it's surrounded by this level. I can't be 100% certain on this claim, but I do hope that many can agree that Lady Comstock's boss fight is just bad, both narratively and mechanically. The series has always struggled with boss fights, and this is no exception. The whole reason we even fight her is because Elizabeth and Booker are once again hit with another roadblock, which is a door that will only open for Lady Comstock. And even though she has been dead for some time, she's been locked in an airtight coffin to preserve her body. But when we open it, she becomes a ghost and raises the dead to fight us. This is truly where the game went off the rails. It felt so far-fetched to me that I was genuinely confused on how this was even possible. The real reason the ghost is even an entity to begin with is because it's a combination of both Elizabeth's feeling towards her and Lady Comstock's body. That's why she acts angrily towards us, just as Elizabeth felt angry at Lady Comstock for not being her mother. The two end up forgiving each other, though, for the pain they cause one another, which ultimately allows us to get into Comstock's house, and Lady Comstock herself gets to rest in peace. I understand Bioshock is a series where we have magic and cities that are located in uninhabitable environments, but I don't recall the series ever going this far with its science fiction elements. The only other time we saw ghosts in this game was back in Rapture, but these were cleared up by the story in a fairly believable way, which was due to Adam not only altering people's genetic code, but by also constantly being recycled thanks to the Little Sisters, it caused certain memories of other people to be shown in the form of ghostly apparitions. Was it a bit much? Maybe a little, but there was at least a valiant attempt to try to explain the phenomenon, and also ground it into the world. This game's version of ghosts is just the complete opposite. She's also an absolute bullet sponge, and while I didn't mind it the first time, my mood got progressively worse after the second and third time we fight her the same exact way. After finally being led inside, we're stopped once again by Resident Roadblock, but this time Songbird actually succeeds and manages to take Elizabeth away from us. Booker manages to just barely survive, but as he attempts to chase her down, he stops momentarily, as he notices that snow is on the ground, despite it being July. Booker has been pulled into yet another version of Columbia. The screams of Elizabeth that we hear in-game are not actually happening in the current Columbia, as he discovers that they're from a tear. This tear is the previous Columbia we were just in, implying he's now somewhere else. This Columbia is what would happen if Comstock fulfilled his prophecy. I told you earlier to remember that quote, the drown in flames, the mountain of man? This is why. This world of Columbia is one where Comstock passes away and Elizabeth has become his successor. At the end of his prophecy is Columbia fighting against the United States. We see a much older Elizabeth as well in this world, and it's discovered that she brought us here into this world to show us what could happen if Comstock wins. She then gives us a note for Elizabeth, but doesn't tell us what it means as it's for her eyes only. Old Lady Elizabeth then sends us back into Columbia, and we're just in time as we can see that they are in the process of extracting Elizabeth's power. Knowing what can happen if they succeed, we put a stop to it and rescue Elizabeth. We're now just a few steps away from reaching Comstock. All we have to do is just get aboard his ship. And if you weren't convinced that Infinite was a playground adventure game with cool explosions and high-octane combat, then this surely should have convinced you. Booker, as a one-man army, charges towards the airship, killing dozens of soldiers along the way. He also has to defend the airship by himself, with the occasional help of Songbird. As an ending battle, it's heroic, tough, and really cool. As an ending for Bioshock, it's absurd. I've already explained in detail my issues about this game's new combat style, as it doesn't fit with the themes of Bioshock, and this fight was a big reason why. Seeing as we finally made it to the ending, we can now understand the story, except we aren't there just yet. Bioshock Infinite really likes to hold the plot twist until the very last minute. In the airship is the Prophet himself. Comstock doesn't tell us anything and instead wants DeWitt to tell Elizabeth the real truth, even though he has no idea what's going on. Due to his ignorance, he takes this opportunity to drown Comstock and put an end to his reign. Honestly, I've been waiting for Booker to be completely honest about his feelings towards Elizabeth, and I'm so glad he was finally able to do that. It's clear that he cares about her. He may not have been before when he first met her, but over time this became more than just a job for him, further solidifying that the way the relationship was written over the course of the game was stellar and by far one of the best parts of this game. 
Fast forwarding a bit, we defend the airship and are able to use Songbird to destroy the tower which houses the siphons that took Elizabeth's powers. Once those were destroyed, she regains all of them back. Immediately after this, we take Songbird down to Rapture, which kills him due to the water pressure. We then take a bathysphere to a weird world with dozens of lighthouses. These doors are like physical doors to other worlds, and with all her powers back, she can see into all of them. Regardless if that door is in the past, present, or future, she can not only see the doors, but also what's inside of them. She's practically all-knowing at this point, which explains why the ending of the game happens the way that it does. At the very end, Booker is taken back to the baptism he had before the events of the game, but he refuses just like before. However, Booker is told by Elizabeth that he didn't refuse in some worlds, and that altered things in that world. It's also revealed that because of this event, Booker is also Father Comstock. After the events of Wounded Knee, Booker was regretful of his actions and saw clarity through religion, but that was in his world. In some worlds, he also refused, but in others, he agreed to the baptism. Those who agreed would become Father Comstock. If Booker refused, he stays the depressed and regretful Booker DeWitt, but if he agreed, he's reborn a new man, one who is cleared of all sins and is reborn again in the face of God. This leads him down a new holier path, and a new man needs a new name, so he would then change it to Zachary Hale Comstock. That is the true plot twist of Bioshock Infinite. Booker has been fighting himself the whole game, but we're still not done yet. Once again, this game is about constants and variables. Everything in Booker's life was a constant up until the baptism. Every single version of Booker, whether they stayed Booker or became Comstock, all took a part in Wounded Knee. That's why Slate was mad at Comstock for claiming to be at Wounded Knee when he knew he wasn't there. He was, but not as Comstock as this was before the baptism. Once Booker goes to the baptism, the world splits. If Booker rejects, he then stays the Booker DeWitt. During this time, Booker would then join the Pinkerton Detective Agency, where he would garner a reputation for ending worker strikes with severe violence. It was also here where he would meet Annabelle, the woman who would eventually become his wife. They would then end up having a child, Anna, yes, I know how confusing that sounds, but this birth would end up causing more problems for Booker. Not only did Annabelle die during the pregnancy, but due to her death, he acquired a massive gambling and drinking problem, leaving him in massive debt. However, Robert Lutess arrived at his office one day and offered to take Anna from him, which would absolve his debt. That phrase, bring us the girl and wipe away the debt, was not about rescuing Elizabeth. It was about selling Anna to Robert so that he could be debt-free. Right after this happened, though, Booker regretted his actions and chased Robert down an alley where he also meets Comstock and Rosalind. Just as he's about to pull her through, her pinky is caught and taken off. Anna is gone. And it's due to this decision that Booker decided to get the AD on his hand for his daughter, Anna DeWitt. But while he may know her as Anna, we know her by a different name, because we know someone else whose pinky is gone. Elizabeth. She is Booker's daughter. Let me dial things back a bit and talk about Comstock, because then this will tie things together. Should Booker accept the baptism, he would then become Comstock. He would then eventually meet Rosalind and create Columbia. During this time as leader and as prophet, he gained a very large following of devotees, one of whom was called Annabelle, the alternate version of Annabelle DeWitt, but now Annabelle Comstock, or as we know her, Lady Comstock. But we know the pair couldn't have a kid due to Comstock being sterile thanks to those tear tests. So he sought out an heir, and the three of them, Comstock, Rosalind, and Robert, determined that an heir from another world could work. This is what caused Robert to meet with Booker, take Anna, then jump back into their world. The only question is what is with the Lutesses trying to help us and encourage Booker to find Elizabeth? Well, the pair ended up discovering what we did, that the destruction of New York would happen if things went to plan. So they attempted to fix their mistake, but as we talked about earlier, they were killed before they could try. However, for some reason, they were able to move across space and time, whenever and wherever they wanted, allowing them both to exist and not exist. Remember, it's all a matter of perspective. Seeing as they were still technically alive, they continued with their plan and found Booker. They then took Booker from his world into one where Comstock was, in hopes of redoing their mistake, but it didn't work. If the coin flip is to be taken literally, then this isn't the first time they've tried to get Booker to kill Comstock. And if I'm not mistaken, then we are the 123rd attempt at this experiment. This would explain why Rosalind in the intro was very annoyed at the experiment since they keep failing. Elizabeth had learned all of this, and both Booker and her agreed that the only way to prevent Comstock from ever doing all of this was to smother him in his crib when he was a baby. Booker meant this literally. Elizabeth meant this metaphorically. Technically, Comstock's first day on Earth was after the baptism, so by killing Booker before the baptism takes place, she would end up killing Comstock before he was even born. The only reason this works is because the baptism is the constant. The outcome is the variable. But by killing him before the baptism, we change the constant, and thus change the entire timeline. Since Booker was never given a choice at the baptism, the variables couldn't exist, thus removing all the Comstocks and Columbias from the timeline. It's a bit confusing 
confusing, but I've always understood this ending as all the bookers that would accept the baptism, meaning they would become Comstock, would all die, and those who don't accept the baptism don't die since they never become Comstock. You may notice during the scene that none of them are wearing the necklace we gave her, meaning that our Elizabeth is still alive. Basically, our Elizabeth, the one we've been with since the beginning of the game, is kind of like the Lutesses. Whereas the Lutesses receive their trans-dimensional powers after death, Elizabeth seemed to just have them because she can open and create tears. After this bombshell of information, we get an after credits cutscene that shows Booker waking up to Anna crying. It's unclear how to interpret this, but some have claimed that this is simply just another Booker before he sold Anna, or that because the timelines got reset, so to speak, that everything is back to normal, but then there's been even more discussion about whether or not Anna is even truly in the crib because we never see her. Personally, I think they just added this because they wanted the game to have a mysterious cliffhanger, as it's really hard to care about when there isn't any substance to go off of, but it's not a huge problem since the answer doesn't matter anyway. This, though, is the full and transparent story of Bioshock Infinite. What an absolute wild story this has become. So firstly, I didn't mind the homage they paid to Rapture, although it does feel a bit like nostalgia bait more than anything to remind us that we're still playing a Bioshock game. It was cool, but it felt a little forced. However, the ending overall was fantastic. Admittedly, it's very confusing and definitely something I didn't understand, but as time went on, things started to click more and more. There is a growing debate though amongst the community about this ending. It's probably the only Bioshock game that is as heavily split. Some saying that this is the best in the series and claim that if you don't like it, it's because you don't understand it. But some argue back and say that they do understand it and still dislike it, or that this complexity is reason enough for them to dislike it. As for me though, I think this ending is really good. Would I have preferred Infinite not go as far as it did with its sci-fi elements? Absolutely, I think the introduction of tears, multiple universes, and quantum mechanics was a bit unnecessary, as this made the story a bit of a chore to sift through so I could finally understand the meaning behind everything. But despite that, Infinite's story wraps up quite nicely, and as a whole, it's pretty great. Once again, Infinite manages to completely fool the player despite the expected plot twist, and the relationship between Booker and Elizabeth was easily the best part of the game. It also seemed to do exactly what it set out to do, provide the fans a Bioshock game that doesn't have many callbacks to the other games, allowing it to live on its own. That's what I would have said if they didn't release the DLC. Bioshock Infinite would eventually add a two-part episodic DLC called Burial at Sea, and when I heard that the DLC was heading back to our favorite underwater city, I was all ears. Burial at Sea starts with Elizabeth entering a detective's office. This detective is Booker DeWitt. It's a different Booker, but the same Elizabeth. We can piece this together from multiple conversations between the two. The reason Elizabeth shows up here is because she's hiring this Booker to find a missing girl named Sally. Considering how strong Elizabeth is thanks to her powers and how much knowledge she has from those powers, we can assume that there's an underlying meaning to all of this. After accepting the job, Booker leaves the office and we're finally able to see Rapture in its prime and it's magnificent. I spent a good hour in this area just taking everything in. Even if it was something that was pretty much insignificant, it was still great to explore. We also get to see the Little Sisters up close and this brings up something we should mention. The time and date for this DLC is December 31st, 1958, the same day that Rapture would be under siege by Fontaine and his Splicer army. This obviously caused a lot of tension within me while playing as I knew at some point things were about to go off. Furthermore, that means that the Little Sisters at this point were only bonded with one Big Daddy, because this is the same date that Delta and Eleanor were patrolling the hallways of Rapture. So Elizabeth takes us to Sander Cohen as she believes that Cohen knows where Sally went. Once again, I really like seeing Sander Cohen again, and it also further confirms that he was always a crazed lunatic even before the riots on New Year's Eve. To get any information out of him, we need to dance for him, just like his previous subjects. However, just like that previous couple, we upset him and Fitzpatrick shocks us. By the way, if that name rings a bell, here's a quick refresher. Oh God, you sick fuck, let me out of there! Afterwards, Booker and Elizabeth wake up in a bathysphere that is headed towards the Fontaine department store. However, we only get to explore the warehouse section of it. This department store was sunk by Andrew Ryan during his feuds with Fontaine. He would eventually lock up any other insane splicers down here so that Rapture could run smoothly. This seems to operate like Persephone, which was also a prison in Rapture, so I guess this means Persephone was for regular inmates and people Ryan believed were going to ruin his city, while the department store seemed to only be related to Fontaine and his army. It's a little weird, but I'll go with it. After tons of combat and exploration, we get some backstory on Sally and discover that after Fontaine and the orphanage went down, 
lots of the little girls were roaming the city. Sally came by, and Booker, being nice, opted to give her a place to settle down, but he assumed it would only be temporary. She enjoyed being around Booker quite a lot, and ended up staying permanently. However, this Booker, like the others, was also a gambler and an alcoholic. One day, he was gambling, and without noticing, Sally was taken. Booker was then told shortly after that she was confirmed dead, but as we'll discover soon, that was a lie. Booker and Elizabeth come across Sally, meaning she's still in fact alive, but she's also inside of one of the little sister vents and won't come out. Elizabeth has the insane idea to heat up the vents and lock all the entrances so that she only has one way to come out. After doing this, Booker runs to the vent to discover that she has become a little sister. Clearly, she is scared and agitated, so that alerts her big daddy and we're forced to fight it. Also, I think this is a plot hole. This should be an Alpha Series Big Daddy, not the bouncer type we see here. The bouncer and Rosie Big Daddies of Bioshock 1 existed at this point in time, but were only used for maintenance and underwater excavation. The Alpha Series were the only ones with a bond, and that bond was with one little sister. After killing the Big Daddy, though, we uncover the full truth of Episode 1. This Booker is actually a Comstock. This Comstock, however, is unique to all the others, as instead of successfully taking Anna from Booker, he failed. Not only did Booker have more control of Anna, but their struggle left Anna's head on Comstock's side, decapitating her. Overcome with guilt, Comstock asked the Lutesses to send him to a place so that he may forget all he has done. This is what caused him to go to Rapture and readopt his Booker name. Comstock is rightfully shocked by this discovery and tries to apologize, but Elizabeth isn't here for apologies, and has him killed by a Big Daddy. Episode 1, minus the slight mix-up with the Big Daddies, was great, and once again makes sense. Elizabeth at the end of the game wanted revenge for what Comstock did to her. We can see that when Booker attempts to stop her. Booker, of course, clarifies that he wants to kill him for her, but this leaves a hole within her. She won't be allowed to take her anger out on the man who not only imprisoned her, but all the other Elizabeths that are connected to her. She feels all their pain, which makes her want for revenge even greater. Plus, she also had to drown her own father, so not only could she not an act of revenge, she had to lose Booker. Despite getting what she wanted, which was to eliminate Comstock, nothing felt complete. So when she discovered this Comstock, she decided to torture him until she was satisfied. Obviously, this sort of ruins the ending of the main game, since this was supposed to eliminate all the Comstocks, but I think the reason this occurred was because since Comstock left the Columbia reality and entered the Rapture reality, he was out of bounds of the Purge. As I said though, really great episode, but now things are going to start to dip. Episode 2 starts with Elizabeth in Paris, or at least her version of Paris. We can tell because of how dramatic everything is. All the residents greet her and treat her like royalty at times. Everyone's also singing along together, and there's even a bird that sings as well when it lands on her finger. Everything is absolutely exaggerated, but it's all taken away when Sally arrives. Elizabeth wakes up, and not only is there a ghost version of Booker here, but Atlas shows up. Atlas decides to shoot Elizabeth, but is stopped once she tells him that she can get him back to Rapture with the help of Dr. Su Chong. Atlas is also now using Sally as a bargaining chip to get Elizabeth to do his bidding. I'm starting to get flashbacks. One thing I sort of glossed over was Booker as a ghost. Well, it seems to be a figment of her imagination, something she made up. She clearly cares about Booker, that is her father after all, so she's probably still trying to deal with the guilt of killing him back in the main game. But we aren't done with the bizarre twists as we find Elizabeth's dead body. Furthermore, due to this, she isn't able to see the different realities and the tears in the doors like she used to. She's just a normal human girl without any way to leave Rapture when she's done. The Lutesses warned that if she went to Rapture to enact revenge on this Comstock, she would collapse, so to speak. I think collapse in this context is the other Elizabeths merging with her, removing her powers and becoming a normal human again. I don't think it's explained why she loses her powers, but it's possible that entering the different reality changed her powers a bit, but that's just speculation. More importantly though, I have to ask, how did she die? This is confirmed to be the same Elizabeth from the main game, the same one who traps Songbird in Rapture immediately after getting her powers back. But she was somehow stopped by a big daddy? It's possible that she isn't on the same power level anymore due to her being in a different reality, as we can see her struggling to open a very tiny tear early in the episode. So maybe what I say is true, or maybe I'm just making creative excuses for the devs to get away with this. Either way, Elizabeth's new objective is to rescue Sally. She feels guilt over using her as bait and hurting her to torture Comstock. She realizes that just as Comstock used her to get what he wants, she used Sally to get what she wanted, making her no better than the man she despised. She wants to make things right and make sure Sally has a future, and to do this she needs to work with Atlas, and this is where I started to lose interest. Infinite tried so hard to separate itself from the other game, and it succeeded. Whether or not you agree with this decision is up to you, but you can't deny that it's its own experience. So why are we going back and using story from the first game? It seems like the studio just couldn't get away from their pride and joy that is Bioshock 1 and needed to come up with a story to sell the DLC. Firstly, Elizabeth needs to find Su Chong, and while she doesn't find him, she does find his temporary lab. 
Rome. In here is photos of Columbia as well as a terror. It's explained that the terror Elizabeth used to get to Rapture took her here, so Su Chong, with the assistance of Andrew Ryan, moved his equipment here to study the terror. Eventually, he would come in contact with Jeremiah Fink, and the two would collaborate and steal each other's ideas. This led to the creation of the Vigors and Songbird. It also led to the creation of the Big Daddies, but only partially, as Su Chong was still trying to figure out how Songbird bonded with Elizabeth, as this was the critical piece he was missing when it came to the Big Daddies. With this discovery, Elizabeth realizes that she can use the terror to get into Columbia and grab the Lutest particle so that she can make the department store float just like Columbia floats. Sadly though, the device was destroyed so she needs to repair it. Once it's fixed, we can take the terror to Columbia. You may be confused as to how a Columbia like this exists, and honestly, so am I. It seems like the main game really tied things up, so by adding a new Columbia, it sort of invalidates all that progress. Even if this is just a tear to the past, it's still a Columbia. This shouldn't really be here. Furthermore, we also see a behind-the-scenes conversation between the Lutesses and Daisy. We learn that the Lutesses were behind the actions of Daisy back in Finkton, explaining that Daisy will die and that she needs to play her part in order for Elizabeth to become a woman, and once again I'm left confused. Daisy has spent years under the oppression of Columbia and its residents. She's also been a leader of the Vox for presumably a few years as well, and she's willing to throw all this away because the Lutesses tell her what to do? Might I remind you that the Lutesses worked for Father Comstock, the person she's trying to kill, so how can she even trust them? Furthermore, if the Lutesses even manage to convince her by showing her other realities or by predicting the future, then this ruins part of the main game's story, as Booker could have easily just told her that he was from a different timeline and not an imposter, which could have stopped all the people we killed that were a part of the Vox. It's never explained what ultimately convinced her, so the team is once again able to get away with this vague scene. Changing the story by giving away very little information that A was never hinted at and B should have never even happened is not good storytelling. And also, in an effort to clown this scene again because I think it's funny, all they said was to take the boy hostage, nothing about the blood wiping, so once again I have to ask what the point was. Eventually Elizabeth will grab the Lutest particle, but Su Chong won't let her leave until she gets him hair of the test subject that was bonded to Songbird, which is quite funny as he is literally talking to that test subject. The hair sample is located in Fink's office and is a really nice location as we get to see all the tests that he ran trying to get Songbird to connect with Elizabeth. It's also pretty horrifying the depths he was willing to go to to do something like this, like hooking up an animal to a mask that would constantly pump oxytocin into their lungs, as well as the other failed test subjects still in the laboratory. Elizabeth then grabs the hair sample and delivers it to Su Chong via pneumo tube, and I don't think it's ever explained in this game, but shouldn't the pneumo tubes be connected? I can't imagine that the tube packages the item and floats it across the water, so how does this get from point A to point B? When Fontaine died, Ryan forced Su Chong to work for him, and that's why his new lab was at the Artemis Suites, far away from this department store. Plus, the store is thousands of meters below Rapture since Ryan sunk it. So is the pneumo tube still connected to the other tube, or was there never a tube in the first place? It's not a huge concern, just something I noticed. After delivering the hair, Ryan appears on the intercom and attempts to kill us. We escape his thugs, make it to the desired location, use the Lutest particle to float the department store back up to Rapture, and then get knocked out by Atlas's men. After this, the story goes back to the roots of Bioshock 1, as Atlas wants us to look for the ace in the hole, who of course is Jack. And while I was very excited to see Jack in some fashion, I don't even really think this was necessary. In the over 10 years since I played the first Bioshock game, not once did I wonder how Atlas got Jack. I think it's more important that he got Jack at all more than how he got him. There's also a myriad of ways you could have explained that he got him to Rapture. This is going to be a bit bold of me, but I'd like to rewrite this episode in a way that would make more sense, at least to me. Firstly, remove any mention of Atlas up until this point. Allow Elizabeth to get up and question how she is alive along with Booker. It'll draw more attention to how Elizabeth ended episode 1 standing and is now starting this episode on the ground. Maybe even add some blood as well to show that she didn't pass out but was actually injured. With Atlas in the picture, all I could care about was him. I didn't even bother questioning how Booker even got here. The way Booker's written into this episode is totally fine. I'm actually okay with him just being a figment of her imagination. The rest of the episode should be spent trying to find Sally, and then this would be a good time to have Sally also be held by Su Chong, since it'll force Elizabeth to go to Columbia and get her hair in exchange for Sally. This, however, though, does involve the Lutest particle and Columbia, something I'd prefer to avoid in this episode, so maybe we can have some joke scene where Elizabeth reveals to Su Chong that she is, in fact, the test subject, and then maybe have Su Chong freak out and get a little angry at the fact that the solution to his issue was literally right in front of him. And seeing as he's in Rapture and not the department store, this could make Su Chong be the sole reason the store was lifted as he needs her hair. This not only connects the following scene with Andrew Ryan, 
line where he says that the deal between Su Chong and Elizabeth was not one he was authorized to make, but this also fits narratively with Su Chong as a character who not only worked with Fontaine before he died and could maybe discover the real identity of Atlas, but also show that he is still a person willing to do anything to get what he wants. Once Elizabeth makes it to Su Chong, she can then drop off her hair, and then right when she meets Sally, she gets knocked out by some thugs, which leads to the scene right here. Once this starts, have the bag stay on Elizabeth's head, but have Atlas talk to his crew while we're here. It sets up Atlas, but also lets the veteran players get excited as his accent is very recognizable. They could even change the name to Man instead of Atlas in the subtitles momentarily so that the reveal isn't spoiled. Then, when the hype of his appearance is still high, rip the bag off and show him. Even keeping this part where the light blocks his face, but then reveals him as he steps closer would have also worked as well. Personally, I would have preferred this DLC just continue its own story and have Atlas be revealed in the last few moments. Since Atlas is now a main character in this episode from the start, it takes all focus off everyone else as he's easily the most important character in this episode. Doing this would also remove the questionable decisions that Elizabeth makes throughout this DLC. As from the moment she meets with him, she knows that she'll betray him, and it ruins all the buildup when it's not only hammered in multiple times that Atlas will likely betray her, but also the fact that Elizabeth keeps helping him despite knowing she won't get the upper hand on him. As we discover at the end, the reason she's doing this is because within all the doors, there was a timeline that shows Sally having a future thanks to Jack rescuing her. But to do this, she needs to go along with the events of the story in order to make this all happen. Which not only undermines all the power and skill Atlas has as a leader, but also makes the reveal of how Atlas got his hands on Jack just really awkward. Furthermore, the only reason she was able to do any of this was because of Booker, who reminds her that she used to see all the doors, meaning she has all the memories of all the doors, regardless of whether it was the past, present, or future. So Booker tries to get her to remember where the location of the ace in the hole is. This confirmed a suspicion I had, and that was that Booker was placed in this episode strictly to explain plot and discoveries the writers couldn't explain on their own, and this makes everything feel so forced. Just have Booker stay a memory, her memory of Booker, the Booker who she grew to love and appreciate, and have him be the shoulder she can cry on. They are father and daughter, after all. Don't add this current Booker that is helping discover the next step in the story because Elizabeth can't remember or is incapable of making a decision. It just feels like such a waste to have the story the way it is now, and it goes back to what I said earlier as it answers a question we didn't even really need answered. The best thing to come from this part, though, was the interrogation scene, which makes me extremely uncomfortable. Where's Mies in the hole? I don't know. You All know right. what else rests in the lobe? Creativity. <sighs> Individuality. <sighs> personality. <sighs> in short, what makes you... You. Continuing with the story though, Elizabeth needs to get to Su Chong's clinic in order to find info on Jack. She then finds the paper that has the would you kindly pass phrase and then gives it to Atlas. During this level, we do get to see how Su Chong died rather than hearing it, and while cool, the story is doing that thing again where it's trying to fit Elizabeth into the plot by having her be the sole reason behind all these events. She was the reason that the big daddies could bond to any little sister. She was then responsible for Su Chong's death and is of course responsible for the events of the whole series since she gave Atlas the pass phrase for Jack. It's completely unnecessary to do all of this, and I have no idea why they thought this was a good idea. Also, unless I'm mistaken, I'm pretty sure the bonding process was created using pheromones of the Big Daddies combined with the mental conditioning that the little sisters underwent. We use the pheromones ourselves in Bioshock 1, and we get to see the little sisters' minds in Bioshock 2, so this whole scene is confusing as it implies that just a little bit of Adam was all that was needed. Even though it's known that the Big Daddies were spliced beyond belief to even get them to function in the suits so they already have Adam in them, plus the Adam the Little Sisters have is probably recycled. You could claim that the Little Sisters have unique atoms since their bodies do contain the sea slug that produces it, but we can see them drinking atom on occasion in game, thus it's recycled anyway. So this is just confusing, for no reason. Elizabeth has such a vital role in her own reality, but they needed to make her have the same role in the Rapture reality, but it was just unnecessary. Now instead of saying that the addiction of Adam, the feud between Fontaine and Ryan, and the values of Rapture were all contributing factors to not only the downfall of Rapture, but the events of the game, it can now just be boiled down to who Elizabeth did it to help Sally. It ruins years of work, and that is extremely upsetting. After Elizabeth gets the passphrase, she gives it to Atlas, as she has to since it will lead to Sally being rescued, to which she receives a wrench to the head for her assistance. We then get a slideshow of the events that took place in Bioshock 1, and see that her vision became a reality as Sally is rescued by Jack and given a future. As she comes back to reality, we can see her holding Sally, while Elizabeth eventually succumbs to her wounds and dies, thus ending the DLC.
Burial at Sea wasn't terrible, but it definitely wasn't great either. It's a DLC that probably didn't need to exist, but I would have accepted its existence if it didn't fumble so hard in the second episode. The DLC not only has a few retcons and plot holes, but also undermines all the story and world building the original game set out to create by pinning all the events on one character. A character that shouldn't have even had this vital of a role in the first place, and arguably shouldn't have even been here anyway. Infinite was made to be different, and a separation from the series, and while I didn't appreciate it that much as I've said before, I will at least commend them for sticking to their original vision and trying to create something new. Despite that, they still couldn't get away from Rapture and thus needed to go back. Was it great to see Rapture in its prime as well as the original cast of characters? Absolutely, but the rest of the DLC soured any enjoyment that I had from it. Bioshock Infinite as a whole is a surreal experience. It's got a compelling story with a wonderful twist, and a great dynamic between the two main characters, and even a decent setup to a DLC in Episode 1, culminating in a good game. But it also has a lack of interesting audio logs, bland gameplay, repetitive locations, and an abysmal second episode that ruins the great parts Infinite established, tearing it down in the process. Had Infinite just ended at the main game, I would have called it great, or even fantastic, but Burial at Sea went too far. It's said that the series had ended on such a conflicting note like this, where people are more than likely likely to argue whether or not the game was even good to begin with, rather than just appreciating how far the series has come. Infinite leaves a permanent stain on this series' fantastic legacy, and that's truly what upsets me the most. But with that finish, we've come to the end of the video, as well as the end of the Bioshock series. Thank you all for watching, and if you watched the previous videos, thank you for coming along for the ride. This series is definitely one of the best of all time, and I don't think anyone can dispute that, and I'm truly thankful that I was able to play these games again so I can share my thoughts with you, even if some of them were quite negative. So thank you for that. Like the video if you enjoy, and subscribe if you're new, and as always, thank you to my returning viewers for coming back to another video. Take care, everyone, and goodbye.